Good evening, USA, and good morning, Asia. I'm Chris Tang, the Faculty Director of the UCLA Center for Global Management. Today's event is hosted by the UCLA Center for Global Management, and it is sponsored by our Anderson Graduating Class of 2022. Over the next hour, we shall discuss with our distinguished guests, Rodney Murray and Kevin Lee, about ways to manage global supply chains in the changing world. Before I introduce them, let me say a few words about today's topic. Supply chain management is changing rapidly since the trade war against China that began in 2018. After we experienced product shortages during the COVID pandemic, the war in Ukraine, and the Israel-Hamas war in Gaza, and now the Houthis attacks in the Red Sea created a new wave of supply chain disruptions. These disruptions triggered firms to rethink about their supply chain management to improve their supply chain resilience and sustainability. As firms also are de-risking from China, new challenges are emerging. Facing with all these challenges and the geopolitical landscape, and also dealing with supply chain risks, how should firm manage all these issues in their global supply chains? To examine this question, I'm delighted to have our guests to share their on-the-ground supply chain strategies with us. Our first guest is Rodney Morey. Rodney is one of our proud executive MBA alumni of class 2023. He is the founder and chief CEO of SourceM, a full service product sourcing agency that leveraged their supply chain expertise to develop and produce custom solutions for their consumer goods and packaging uh, clients. Next, our second guest is also one of our proud executive MBA alumni of class 2022, Kevin Lee. Kevin is a co-founder and is a COO of Hoolies Golf, a golf apparel company that manufactures, sources, and distributes its apparel products globally. He's also the CEO of Apex International, a global sourcing company that provides end-to-end -end supply chain solutions. Ronnie and Kevin, thank you for joining us this evening. So to kickstart our discussions, I would like to start with Kevin first. Can you describe your business with us? Sure. First of all, um, welcome to our MBA 22's reunion, I mean, speaker series. It makes it seem like MBA 22's reunion because we contribute a lot to um, the, the event that we have now, but mainly it's basically Chris, uh, Professor, Professor Tang, as well as Lucy, that provided a lot of dedication a lot of the resources to put this together. Without them, we would not be having this kind of event. Can you imagine us not meeting every, what, uh, three to six months uh, for us to get together like this? So really appreciate all the things that you guys have done for us. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, when you compare our UCLA Anderson School versus other schools, our school is more, um, more relational rather than transactional for a lot of other schools out there. Because otherwise, how can we meet up like this and, and have the school to provide avenues for us to network and get to meet uh, everyone else? And it's really amazing how we have, look at, look at everybody. This is amazing where other 22s and 23 MBAs as well as other cohorts getting together like this. This is incredible. So, so thank you once again. Okay. So I currently have two different responsibilities. Let me. Uh, Click, click, click. Sorry, <laughs> tech, there we go. So I have two different responsibilities right now. First is Apex International that manages global supply chain around the world. Basically what, it, what we do is we manufacture any apparel needs that you have and uh, we have to look at strategic ways of manufacturing all of our products. And that's one of the ways of doing it. And I've been doing it for 25 years and uh, it's been pretty, uh, pretty challenging in the last uh, decade or so. And navigating the complexity of global supply chain is very difficult, so I'm gonna break it down into two different simple ways of doing it. So, um, 
phase one will be a very simple transactional uh, way of managing supply chain. Uh, you go through uh, manufacturing, you get your products made, you get it delivered. It's a pretty simple way of doing it. Second option, I'm not gonna go over all the details, we don't have a lot of time. Second option is, is when we have other issues taking place. So um, what happens if there's um, um, a catastrophic situation taking place? And that's when the professional uh, supply chain management people comes in, where we provide answers to what if, what if something goes wrong? And it did go wrong many different times. And one of the examples I'm gonna share with you guys is this. Uh, duties and tariff, we have two different ways of managing it, but what happened was, Back in March of 2000, uh, 2018, Trump administration decided to levy um, a, a tariff against uh, 200 or $350 billion worth of Chinese goods. And we were flooded with a lot of phone calls around the world. They go, what do I do? Do I pull out from China? Do I navigate? Uh, how do I get this thing resolved? And people are panicking, and we have to provide solutions for most of our customers. And that's where we come in, you could actually do it through um, Alibaba or other platforms in the world to get your products made, but it will be difficult for them to provide you with solutions, right? So um, that's the kind of service that we provide to all of our customers. And uh, when you look at the next stage, this is the uh, different competitive advantage that we could actually have around the world. And um, this, this is basically our uh, minimum wage. Obviously our factory uh, employees make a lot more than that, but when you look at that, uh, you provide um, avenues as to where and how to transport your production uh, because um, you know Madagascar obviously is extremely low, but can you always go there? Most likely not, depending on what the kind of products you're trying to look at. So it's still made by hands, it's very important, um, but the first meeting that we have with any sort of customers that we deal with, they ask for social compliance. Social compliance is the most important project or a component when it comes to social um, or global supply chain management. Okay, so if you guys know anybody who's looking into um, um, uh, sourcing things out or looking for apparel related for production, give me a call, okay? <laughs> Just making it out there. So our um, next topic is Huli. This is uh, my passion project. Uh, this is the only time that I would ask you guys to take your phone out, take a QR code right there. It's all, it's all in there. Um, it'll get you to our website. But uh, it's the project that we worked on as a BCO. It was birthed and breathed and uh, created within UCLA. And um, Bobby and I, I'm not sure he's here yet, but uh, he's a CEO, I'm a CEO. And uh, with my experience of 25 years of apparel manufacturing around the world, with his experience of Navy SEALs for 20 years, he just retired, uh, we collaborated together to uh, disrupt the golf apparel industry. And that's what we're trying to get to. Okay. So our next page will be our flagship a product. It took us eight months to get this fabric perfected. Um, it's gonna have all our name and representation and reputation on the line. Last thing we wanna do is just have any product out there. So this one has all the features and all the functions that you need for you to play golf in the most uh, dynamic way possible. And um, yeah, we've been, um, this is, has been biggest seller for, for our products. Okay. Our value proposition is that the material is amazing, the quality is amazing, obviously, uh, but it's all cut and sewn in LA. And uh, when we are competing against, thank you, thank you. When we're competing against um, all the other brands that are manufactured overseas, you know, it's, it's not a fair game, but we wanna make sure that all of our products are cut and sewn in the United States. That's the, uh, the value proposition that we're trying to bring, okay? The next uh, product that we have, these are all the polo shirts that we have, and next product is we got t-shirts, we got hoodies, we got hats, and uh, I'm just gonna go skim through uh, immediately so that you guys could all take a look at it later. And then, this is the only time, I'm so sorry, I have to take my jacket off <laughs> to, to show off. So this is the only time that I will not get offended for you to come and touch my shirt afterwards, okay? 
So it's up to you guys. All right. And, and um, that's it for me. And then one last thing. Uh, if you could actually go to the website, if you're inclined to purchase anything, we will go ahead and offer uh, free code for just for you guys and Zoomies. Uh, if you punch in uh, UCLA free ship, this will be the only time you guys wait all the free shipping. Just letting you guys know, just in case. Okay, and that's it. Well, Let's thank go. you, Kevin. <laughs> this is a truly a homegrown product and also conceptualized during the MBA, executive MBA program. The journey is fantastic. This is really good. Now I'm going to turn it uh, over to Rodney. He's going to talk about his company, Source M. Hello, everyone. Um, agreed. Thank you guys all for making it out here tonight. Um, I know it wasn't necessarily easy for everyone, and, and it's pretty awesome to see how many people actually showed up, especially on a, a topic such as supply chain, which isn't always the most interesting in some people's eyes. Um, as, an, as an example, I, you know, I, for the, those who know me, I, I like to inject a little humor into pretty much everything I do. Um, I spent two hours last night trying to look up supply chain jokes, and if you ever want to feel emotionally dead inside, I recommend you go Google supply chain jokes. There's not a single funny one. <laughs> um, but I'll talk about SourceM real quick. Uh, so we're, we're a product development uh, and sourcing agency uh, that specializes in uh, high-end packaging, retail, and promotional goods. Um, to give an idea, so here are some of the different products, types of products we produce. Um, luxury packaging for companies uh, like Lady M and Neiman Marcus, uh, plastic goods for companies like Sugarfina. Uh, we do some soft goods, uh, but I will say that the interesting juxtaposition between myself and Kevin is he, he mostly does soft goods and I mostly do hard goods, um, and they do take different skill sets. Um, things like glassware, the last one over there is, uh, is an aluminum container. Um, and they're all different materials, and we can do that because we don't really specialize in a specific material type, but really more uh, of a framework. Um, and what that looks like is designing the product, uh, so that in includes creating the drawings, um, then we engineer it to make sure that it's actually manufacturable. Um, from there we prototype it, whether that means 3D printing or creating sample molds. Uh, we'll actually go out and do the sourcing. This is the, the bread and butter, I would say, of what we do. Um, reaching out to different factors that we may work with or, or may be new to us um, to make sure that we're getting the right, the right factory for the right project. Um, QC and testing is a very, very important part of our business. Having in-house quality control inspectors at the factories to make sure that what's being made is, is exactly what we want and testing for things like Prop 65, BPA, regulatory compliance. Uh, and finally, the logistics side of it, getting it from wherever it's being made to wherever it needs to go. And we apply that framework across various different countries. Uh, so obviously our headquarters are here in LA. Um, our biggest office, even bigger than LA, is actually in China. Um, and we also have offices in Vietnam, uh, India, and Mexico where we source out of as well. Wow, thank you, Kevin. This is really exciting. This is truly global. Um, now, let me start with you because it's a finish. You, 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 you help your client to design the packaging materials, mm. right? So, of course, cost is one of the elements. But I'm curious, uh, do, do they or do you take uh, sustainability into consideration? Mm. That's a great question. So we're actually, I didn't really mention on the slides, but we're probably the country's uh, foremost agency when it comes to advising on sustainable materials, and not just materials, but production methods, which is something I, I think gets lost uh, often in discussions about sustainability. Um, but our job, our job is to kind of coach our clients through what is possible, depending on what their goals are from a sustainable perspective, right? Do they want to make it recyclable or do they want to make it from recycled products? Uh, do they want to make sure that, uh, you know, when it gets into the hands of ones that it's actually compostable or not? That's all things that we help them out with through letting them know what kind of materials and production me methods are available to get their, their goals achieved. I see, so you provide advice, suggestions, depending Correct. on what type of sustainability issues they want to uh, That's cope with. All right, because uh, even recycling is very complicated. Even your plastic bottle, not all of them are recyclable. Sure. 
even your glass jar is not the same. Sure. They're different types. All right, so let me turn to Kevin. When you talk about uh, your Apex uh, supply chain experience, it seems your clients focus on cost in terms of the tariffs and, and whatnot. Now, but then your Hoolies, they're produced in Los Angeles. So there could be some kind of trade-off between cost, quality, and speed. So how, how does it play in your role in, in that sense? Because there are trade-offs. That's a very good question. Um, there's a saying in our industry where uh, you have to pick two of the three components, which is delivery, quality, or price, right? You can't have everything in the world. <laughs> so uh, for Huli, uh, we made it clear that it has to be cut and sewn in the United States. That's not gonna change. So we'll keep it exactly the same. For other products, uh, for Apex side, um, it all depends on what customer is looking for. Um, obviously, we can't bring all of our products um, to Africa where it will take two months just to bring the products in. By the time that gets in for fast fashion, it'll be done. You'll be out of fashion and by the time the logistics goes around. So there's ways we could actually provide solutions. And um, one of the examples that we could provide is, um, I won't be able to say the name, but uh, largest, um, it's not fast food restaurant anymore. It's called quick service restaurants. Just uh, being PI to see out there. So uh, quick service restaurant, one of the largest um, uh, uh, restaurant um, uh, brand, they came up, uh, they asked us to provide solutions for, uh, for their uniform needs. What we did was we provided hybrid uh, solutions and that is for us to manufacture, to launch within three months to get it done out of uh, regional local areas and then provide longer solutions for uh, them to manufacture overseas and further away in, in Africa. That way we provide a holistic solutions to our customers. That's what we provide in order for them to have a full ownership of the ecosystem. Very good. Now, we cannot really, to, to, uh, not to mention about the challenge of the supply chain due to disruptions, your political issues. So I'm curious, right now, given the, the, the changing world in the Middle East, in Asia and whatnot, how has it really affect your type of sourcing strategy for your clients? Are they asking you to diversify more to uh, Vietnam and India that you have offices? Do you see the trend is moving that way? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, look, when, when I, I literally remember the day that the Trump tariffs were announced and it turned my world upside down. Um, and that was just the beginning. You think about, about COVID and all the, all the factories shutting down. You think about all the demand on this side, pushing prices even higher. Uh, you think about the electricity shortages that took place in China. There's been so much volatility over the past seven years. Uh, it's, it's by far been the wildest time in supply chain since World War II, I think. Um, and, and that caused our phones to ring a lot. Um, it caused us to do things like open offices in Mexico, open offices in Vietnam um, and India. And, and to, I guess, to, you know, we, is it a good thing? It depends on how you look on it, look at it. You know, it was a lot of effort, a lot of human resources and capital to do so. Um, so it was a big drag on our business from that perspective. Um, but on the flip side of that, it's what made us a strategic, gave us a strategic advantage, especially when a lot of customers, I'm guessing Kevin might agree with this, a lot of companies that do what we do are actually based uh, in China rather than in the US. So they couldn't pivot, um, but we could. Mm, very good. So, but to push this idea further, so in the case you try to reduce the disruption, then one idea is the reshoring to cut and sew in Los Angeles. Kevin, I want to ask you, by doing that, I know that they will create jobs in the United States, which is great, but the Americans may not want to pay for a higher price. So how do you wrestle with this dilemma in terms of reshoring? So yeah, um, when you look at the cut and sew cost alone, uh, for you to do it in LA, it costs five times more than for you to do it overseas, which is crazy amount for you to, to bear. But because that is the, um, the market we're trying to go after, we have to bite the bullet and get it done. And that's why 
if you log into our website, uh, some people do say that it is on the higher end of our pricing market, um, but there's a reason behind it. A lot of our customers are coming back. They love the story that we have to tell and they love the quality that we provide and they want to equip their, all their sales team, for example. They have a lot of group sales. They buy dozens at a time so they could actually um, uh, have the people wear it and a lot of golf tournaments who are uh, military veteran owned or operated uh, golf tournaments, they come and order a lot of our polo shirts. And we get a lot of support. We get crazy support from around the uh, customer base that wanted to uh, do a lot of our programs. So, um, so that is more on the Huli side. When it comes to uh, Apex, um, when it comes to uh, near shoring, there's a lot more than just USMCA uh, program you could do that in Mexico. Um, just by show of hands, did anybody hear about a CAFTA? Um, Central America uh, free trade. So there's CAFTA uh, programs that uh, people could um, accustom to, which is uh, below Mexico, above uh, South America. Those are the areas we could actually collaborate together, as well as HOPE, which is Haitian uh, program that provide duty free. So there are a lot of other near shoring opportunities that we could all collaborate together. The funny thing is they have a program where you cannot share the program together. For example, you cannot get Guatemala fabric and make it into Mexico, and bring it in duty free. It does not work. You cannot mix the two programs together. You gotta separate them apart. Mexico production or any USMCA production has to be stay within. Any CAFTA has to stay within, but Haiti is a different story because they wanna bring a lot of um, uh, investment uh, over in Haiti side. But besides that, so there's a lot of opportunities that we could provide, all depends on what the need is. So. Yeah, neoshoring is has been very rampant in the last uh, seven years after uh, um, the tariff got implemented. Wow, this is very interesting when you talk about neoshoring, uh, because uh, after NAFTA now we're USMCA agreements and it's really booming in Mexico. So uh, just in two, uh, 2023, Mexico became the biggest importer for the United States, uh, overtook China. Uh, first time in 20 years now. But then as uh, companies like uh, Rodney's company and Kevin's company, you also do uh, in Asia, they also do in Mexico. Uh, tell us what are the challenges? Because it sounds easy thing to do, just <laughs> shift it to Mexico, ship it to oh. Vietnam, ship it to India. Can you share with us uh, in terms of, uh, are there any challenges that you face? There is a lot. <laughs> a lot, a lot, a lot of challenges. Um, look, China has been producing goods for the American market, you know, for the past 20, 30 years. Uh, Mexico, not really, and especially not on the consumer goods side where, where I think Kevin and I mostly work. You know, it's, it's, it's been frankly extraordinarily difficult to source goods out of Mexico. Um, and there's many reasons why they, they haven't aligned themselves with American business culture. Uh, getting answers takes a week for some simple requests sometimes. Um, their infrastructure is just not built out the way China's, ha uh, China's infrastructure has been built. Um, even if the costs are similar, you could think of like a, a simple plastic product, like this clicker, right? Uh, if you were to make this in China, the, the company that's actually injecting this will either make the molds that are required for it in-house or they have someone down the street that can do it. Um, and do, do it, let's just say, each component is a $10,000 mold. Um, if you try to do something like this in Mexico, while the price per unit might be close for the plastic pieces, Mexico hasn't built out, built out an industry around creating molds. And so what they have to do is now go to whoever the injection machine manufacturer who makes the actual machines recommends that molds, or wherever they recommend the molds be made, and it's usually in Japan or Korea or something like that, and that same $10,000 mold will literally cost 80 grand. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and that's per component. There's, there's multiple components on this thing. Uh, and so even though the per unit cost is the same, trying to, trying to source something like that out is, is, from a cost perspective, can be impossible or just a massive hurdle to overcome. So that means the cost could be higher and also we may take even uh, longer. longer, yeah, yeah. Because of the many transactions. the molds all the way over from Asia to, to Mexico, yeah. 
I see. Yeah. Now, but Kevin, you have done some work uh, that's actually sourced from Mexico by taking advantage of the US uh, MCA, the free trade agreements. Yes. So do you encounter these kind of challenges as well? Yeah, it's very uh, consistent with what you talked about. Um, the other issue that I'm going to be as honest as possible with you guys, because this is where we could be, but um, we got one of our containers stolen. And, um, and a driver was away on a lunch break. Um, someone got access to the container. All the content is missing. And uh, we just couldn't continue on. And we had delivery date. Our customer is not going to really care as much if they want their products on time as we promised, because that's a contractual agreement. So we had to scramble to remake the products, rush through the uh, ways of getting it done, and bring it back in. Fortunately, we were late by two weeks or so. Our customer was nice enough to let that one go. But uh, security and uh, having investment protected is, it was a very, very difficult process for us. And we went to a lot of insurance companies. They would not insure our containers in down in Mexico. And um, some of the other issues that we had was, if that's the case, we've got to take matters to our own hands. So we hired a security uh, uh, team to follow the container all the way to the border and made it until it crosses the border to make sure that we have secured the product. So I don't know who's going to wear the neon polo shirts out in Mexico, but we have a container missing right now. So uh, this is a couple of years back, but it does happen. And it's part of life and part of the uh, supply chain that you have to manage and deal with. Wow, we did not know supply chain could have security issues. <laughs> That's good to know. Now, so Ronnie, you mentioned that, okay, Mexico is uh, challenging because of the infrastructure may not be there and may not have the end-to-end -end supply chain solutions. So, so now the talk of the town is India. India, Vietnam, Cambodia, you name it, right? Now, so I'm curious, uh, because if you ship things out from India, uh, Currently, you usually go to the East Coast. Mm. You try to go through the Suez Canal, then go through the Red Sea. Now, Red Sea is a iffy situation, mm -hmm. but then also create another layer of security, right? So to secure uh, the deliveries for your clients, how do you deal with that kind of uncertainty? Yeah, I mean, for better or worse, going through COVID and the Suez Canal kind of prepared us for this and allowed us to have protocols <laughs> in place. Um, but like to really to really simplify it, uh, the, the answer is you, you have to order more. You have to be prepared to hold, hold more inventory um, and, and just order more and order it sooner so that when those delays take place, you're not just stuck in the canal and, and can't get through anywhere. I see, by ordering more, that means that's in case. Now, but then the question is that you are uh, taking uh, bearing the cost or your clients is going to bear the cost for our business model it's our clients who who bear the cost we'll we'll hold on to it until it delivers to them okay but that's that's not as uh, drastic as of a cost as much of a burden as holding inventory so you're lucky your clients wouldn't do that now but Kevin you are the clients <laughs> okay you're the hoolies suppose that you have to import some of the materials from various countries because of supply chain disruptions. If you order more, you're bearing a bigger risk because uh, you have so many different designs. Some of the design may not sell. Then how do you cope with that? Yeah, so that is a million dollar question. How to deal with um, uh, products that are not moving as much, uh, how to deal with inventories to bring products in. Um, we had incidents where um, US Customs all of a sudden decided to hold our products. And uh, we can't fight against them. They're the big bully. They said, hey, I'm going to hold on to it as long as I want. And uh, who bears the cost of warehouse fees and inspection fees and all that? It's consumers. We have to pay for it. So those are the struggles <laughs> that kind of we uh, deal with. And um, just to um, uh, echo what you're talking about, uh, we have to hold a little bit more inventories. But the other option is to airship most of the products in. That's the only way for us to solve problems. So, you gotta have a lot of capital. So when you, when, you, when you look at into corporate world, there's going to be a lot of um, you know, CSEOs that are fighting off of CFOs where they're demanding uh, more of uh, the inventory to be kept in a warehouse, whereas CFOs say, no, that's gonna um, lock up all of our finances. And we can't do that. 
cash flow is a, is a key factor of maintaining the uh, production or the company is sustainable. So there's going to be always struggle that's like going to take place and it is a fine balance. Is there a right answer for that? Highly unlikely, but there's always going to be a struggle. It depends on who has a lot of voice. That is all about money, right? It's all <laughs> about money. money, yes. So Ronnie, come back to you. So you are helping your client to diversify the supply chain risk. So you have it in, uh, besides China, you have in Vietnam, uh, India, Mexico, and all this. Uh, that gives you the flexibility, right? Sure. But it comes with the cost, mm. it comes with the, uh, the, the management, the coordination. Mm -hmm. That would take time and cost. So do you find this is a way to make your supply chain more resilient or is it other better way? It, it definitely makes our supply chain more resilient. Um, you know, especially, I, I think it's important to, to understand that even though like for us, we have offices in Vietnam and, and, and India, it's first of all, it's not always cheaper. It's, it's it, I would actually say Vietnam, it's, it's kind of a coin flip on, it depends on the product, on whether it's actually gonna be cheaper or not. Um, but it, for us, it definitely ends up being worth it because sometimes customers just don't want things made in China anymore. And that's okay, that's their decision. Um, but the truth is, is that, is that despite what people want, the reality is that China still has so much more value on most consumer goods compared to anyone else that it's, it's not even a race half the time, right? Unless, unless the value proposition is specifically something like made in America, if you rule that out, China's value prop still reigns supreme. Um, you think about, I'll give one example. If you wanna make, this is, this is a real life example. Let's say you wanna make a glass container uh, for soap, right? Uh, sounds simple enough, but then you realize you have the glass container, that's one factory. You have the pump for the glass container. That's another factory. You wanna make your glass container to be safe in case it drops on the floor a little bit, then you need a silicone factory for a base for the glass. You wanna make it look nice, you have to add a frosted finish, which is a de decoration technique that requires another factory. Only in China can you find all those factories in the same place. You really can't get that anywhere else. And if you do, if you go to say Mexico or Vietnam or whatever, Maybe you'll find one pump factory to, to be somewhere nearby that glass factory, but it's just gonna be one. It's just gonna be one factory and they might have a few options, but in China you have literally any option you want. That's a very good uh, reminder. Although a lot of companies are thinking about de-risking, meaning shifting away from China, but as of now, as Rodney pointed out, a lot of the components, they already have the end-to-end -end supply chain solutions. If you, unless you move the entire thing out, otherwise even Mexico or Vietnam is still relying on China for some of the components. Very, very true. I think that's a super important point. Even if you produce things in Vietnam, even if you produce things in Mexico, you better bet those raw materials and inputs are probably still coming from China. Exactly. So for, for the audience may not realize it, the, uh, the COVID test kits that the government give it to for free, they have to make millions and millions of those test kits. There's only China is the only country in the world can actually make that. No other, no, no place else. So it's just, you don't realize those are orange box, take a look, it was made in China. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Kevin, come back to you. So now you have started your hoolies and all this. Uh, so the cost is higher. And also, Rodney's cost also high because more resilience. How do you communicate to your clients? Because I said, well, hey, I want you. Do you want your product to be available uh, quickly, uh, more reliably? So I have to be, provide the resilience. It costs you more more money. How do you articulate, justify, explain the cost will be higher? How do you do that? Luckily. There's not much explaining left to do because we already went through COVID and people see what happens when you have your goods being made in a place that is prone to shutdowns. Um, whether it be due to, to the pandemic or due to infrastructure, whatever it may be. It's actually really nice being someone in my position at the moment 
because for years prior to that, we could get up on the podium and, and preach how important it is to build an, actually resi an actual resilient supply chain, not just the cheapest one. And now people are starting to understand the consequences of just doing things as cheaply as you can and are often willing to pay a little bit more to make sure that they get, they get what they need when they need it. Just something to add to it, yeah. Kevin? Uh, for us to um, yeah, convince our customers that uh, made in US is always superior, better, um, we're not going after everyone out there. We're going after people that appreciate made in USA products. So um, yeah, we, so if you don't want to pay that extra few dollars because you want to look for cheap value um, uh, products out there, then I'm sorry, but you may not be our customer that we're trying to go after. But people who appreciate what we're trying to do, bring the products back to the United States and making the products that are sustainable, that are going to provide consistent quality, um, then you're the right person for us. So yeah, we can convince everybody to buy from us, but uh, those people who appreciate our story and our, our brand, they'll continue to come back. Wow, so I think actually uh, after the crisis, actually things that actually make your life easier because now you don't need to sell because they got burned. So now <laughs> that I was willing to pay more to make sure the product is available. So that is a good sign. I can tell you supply chain has never been more exciting. Since COVID is on the news every day. So now <laughs> it's true. the EV. So I'm going to write an article about EV because in terms of uh, US tried to block all the Chinese uh, EVs and all the components. But I think that some people tell them this is virtually impossible. That's right. right. All right. So let's look into the future. So now uh, we're here. So now we're thinking that we diversify the supply chain. Uh, we have nearshoring, onshoring, uh, and friendshoring, and all this. Looking ahead, we have uh, technologies coming. 3D printing technology, and also some other automation is coming. So do you foresee that in the future, how the supply chain structure is going to evolve? because of technology, AI, and whatnot. What do you think? Ronnie, start with you. It, I, I do think it's going to play a role. Um, this might just be, be me, but I think, I think the role of tech and AI in supply chain is, is going to be a little bit slower than other industries. And the reason I say that is because, frankly, you look at, like, let's take one part of it, logistics, logistics as an example. It's an incredibly antiquated industry. And there's so much ground to be made up that they still haven't done so. And there's companies that are trying as hard as they can. Um, one thing that comes to my mind is, is Flexport. They're trying to revolutionize uh, supply, uh, specific, specifically the logistics side of it. And um, doing okay. You know, it's, it's really, really difficult. I think, I think part of it is because, you know, at the end of the day, you're still dealing with physical goods. And yeah, you can use tech and AI to, to make improvements but it, that tech is gonna have a much bigger impact on things that are actually tech-based, that involve data being transferred around the world rather than physical products. Okay, so that means that AI is, uh, is coming, but not as quickly in the supply chain era. So that is an interesting point. Kevin. Um, there's a new saying going around where speed is a new currency, right? The faster you get products in, the faster uh, the cash will turn. Um, when you manufacture products overseas, especially in India or Vietnam or even Africa, uh, it takes about six months for you to invest your, product, uh, your, your currency into uh, raw material, ship it all the way across around the world, manufacture it, bring it back, takes two months to get it back to the States, sell it, it takes about six to eight months to get your, uh, your cash back uh, to keep that company running. How do you manage that? by cutting whole manufacturing cost or manufacturing timeline. So uh, AI could actually play a role. Uh, there's a way you could actually get things, uh, like for example, the fitting approval. You could actually uh, find a way to make that faster, quicker, and that could save about a month or so. Can you imagine having a cash flow uh, knocked away by like a month or so? That's going to save a lot of um, interest cost, a lot of opportunities. So yeah, um, there's, it's a little bit slower than other industries, but um, yeah, I see it coming where we could actually um, get a lot of things approved and developed uh, using AI uh, technology, very, very soon. <laughs> right, so I think that AI in terms of product design is much faster, mm -hmm. and now even clothing design company, they use AI right. tools as well. Now, the cash and cash 
cycle is really uh, really uh, true now. But then I think that in the future, I think that in terms of getting the products, the right products at the right time in the right place, the nearshoring may be a one option. Mm -hmm. Because that's uh, in, in your case, like Hoolies is uh, cut and sewn in Los Angeles, but you're much closer to the market. You can actually detect the market trend faster than your competitors because the competitors cannot move, change as quickly as you do. Right. So therefore, although the cost is higher, but you also gain the speed right. in return, mm -hmm. right? So that is an interesting dynamics. So I think that is really uh, valuable to us. All right, in real time, I know that the audience would love to ask you some of the uh, interesting questions. So <laughs> I'm going to stop here. We're going over to the floor for for you. Uh, thank you so much, guys. Uh, supply chain is uh, relatively new to me, so this is really great insight. Very, very interesting. I am curious um, about this, Rodney, this um, information here about your employees. You've got 25 across five countries. Can you talk a little bit about um, how your company is structured and, um, you know, how do you, how do you keep your culture consistent and how do you control your quality, your internal processes, things like that. Um, and, and I'm really curious too, like how would this change or how do you see this changing in the future? Sure. Just to clarify, do you want me to talk about the different offices and the roles in the organization? Sure, that, sure, so? yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so in, in LA, it's all the customer facing stuff. Um, so all the account management, um, uh, all the heads of our departments are, are here in LA. Um, and so anything, once again, anything customer or financial related is, is all based out of here. In China, we have our actual sourcing team. So those are the guys that are talking to the factories on a day-to-day -day -day basis. Um, our engineers are in China as well. Uh, our product designers are actually in China as well because we want them to work super closely with our engineers. Uh, to make to make sure that whatever's being designed can actually be produced. I think that's a really important thing that a lot of uh, companies mess up. Um, and then our quality control team is also uh, based in country as well. Um, so, so we'll have QC in all the different places, um, but all design and engineering uh, will, will primarily come out of China for now. Um, in regards to culture, that's actually a really good question. Um, how do we maintain culture across all those countries? We've done a good job. I'm trying to think of how we've done a good job. <laughs> um, we, you know, I think we get in a lot of FaceTime. Like every Monday and Thursday, we're, the, our, all our teams talk to each other uh, on, on a big hall, pretty much. Um, once a month we do like video, so they can actually see our faces. Um, a lot of our team goes back and forth between the countries as well. So I think that creates a lot of dynamic. Like you'll hear everyone in the company talk a lot about how it feels like a family, um, which I think is really great. And I think that's because all of us have actually spent a lot of time working closely with, with each other. Um, so I come from a textile manufacturing background and I was curious how you guys have seen the role of technology in sort of maintaining authenticity. So a lot of certifications around the source of materials and things like that. Um, so how have you seen that in your businesses? And I'd be interested to know how it works on a larger scale, maybe with Apex and maybe on a smaller scale with like some specialized products. Well, I appreciate the question. Um, basically, when you have certification of the authenticity of the fabric, we have to make sure that we first trust and validate. So we will take uh, internal testing uh, labs first, but we do have to hire a third party lab to go ahead and verify and validate that information because you know, they're all people that you have relationship with. But um, we have to also provide that information to uh, our customers as well because they're also asking for the exact same information. So we have to um, have a validation process and that's the only way for us to verify it. And they would actually go to the fax, uh, physical mill to make sure that they're there while the kneading or weaving is taking place so that they will be able to see it and verify it themselves as well. So yeah, third party is the way to do it. We don't we don't do as much when it comes to fabric, um, but I will say you know like look, you, you look at something like uh, products made of recycled plastic PCR, right? How do you know when you're buying the product that it is actually 
made of 25%, 50%, 100% PCR, right? As the consumer, you pretty much have no idea. You just have to take the brand's word for it, right? A lot of our customers, and, and we've actually gained clients this way, they, they tell us, yeah, we, our products are being made of 25, 50, 100% PCR, and we say, how do you know? And they go, I don't know. Uh, our supplier told us it is, right? <laughs> And where's your supplier in some other country far off away where they have zero liability to you legally in a situation like this? And so it's actually a big reason why companies work with us. We have actual quality control inspectors that are there at the factory watching the product be made, watching the PCR actually go into the machines uh, and verifying that whatever that bag is that's even going in the machine is actually uh, post-consumer recycled plastic. Um, I have a question for Kevin Lee. Um, uh, I'm just curious if you can share maybe some of your working experiences on social compliance and what that would look like in the garment manufacturing industry. Wow, um, thank you. That's a very good question. <laughs> Again, I talked about it earlier. Social compliance is a, is a big, big factor for all of our customers. And there's, there are two stories I'd like to share that actually happened um, in my lifetime, and that is First one is like very kind of weird timing where uh, it was during the summertime. Um, we have to get our factory audited by one of our largest customers to request. And um, it was summertime, kids are on a break. And um, it was the, uh, the contractor who uh, makes lunch for the factory because the uh, factory provides lunch for all the employees. So mom makes all the uh, food and everything else to bring it in. But because it's summertime, uh, kids couldn't go to school because you know she's only 10 year old so she can't really uh, stay by herself so she brings the kid along and when mom is unloading the basket of food to the factories she can't just sit in the car so the daughter helps out moving the food to the basket to the factory and that's when the auditor was there and they're saying this is child labor and it took me six months to explain that is a contractor, not the employee of the factory, that brought their, so is it right or wrong to leave a child behind by herself in the middle of the day so that she could come into work? Or is it better to just have that? So that was, that gave me a lot of headache for quite some time. Mm -hmm. But the second story that I'd like to share, which is a little bit more sensitive in nature, um, there's an um, Asian country that I actually visited when I was in college, this, uh, or undergrad. And it was for a mission trip where we had to go and help out with less fortunate village. And there's a family uh, with parents that were missing limbs because of leprosy. The main cause of leprosy is because of malnutrition and they couldn't work. But they had a daughter who was actually going to the factory. She was, she was like 12 or 13, I believe. And um, you know, my heart breaks when you, when you go there, you know, parents missing limbs. Um, they're trying to rely on a daughter to go in and, make the living for themselves. And yeah, my heart just broke. A week later, I go back, and um, she, was, um, she was let go because of compliance issue. The factory I just had to uh, let go of all the uh, employees that are less than 18. And she was let go, but because they had no means of survival, a coyote came uh, uh, where they have to sell the, um, um, the daughter to the, uh, the local coyotes to sell it. And the promise that they made, the coyotes made to the parents is, I'll promise her a job in city so she'll be able to work at a factory. But who knows where she's uh, landed afterwards. So is it right for us to stop the child labor at the factory level? Or is it right for us to um, you know, uh, really condemn the people that are uh, really being able to not be able to survive or support the family? I'm not sure what the right answer is. I have no solution for that. I have no, so, but that really got me for, for several years, how to manage that and navigate through that. So, so um, what I walked away was this. Um, basically, um, a Carl, uh, an amazing psychologist, uh, Carl Young, talked about it uh, all the time, and that is um, it takes a lot of mental power for you to think properly or for you to even analyze situations. I'm um, improvising. But it takes a quick second to judge. So instead of rather jumping into a conclusion and judging uh, what's taking place, if you could actually take a stand and understand what took place and why it took place and go a little bit deeper into the situation, 
that would actually um, give you a lot more ways of navigating and, um, and providing solutions to everything that's taking place. So you can't just take anything for face value. You gotta go deeper into it and understand what the cause of that situation is. So yeah, that's the uh, social compliance side of, of uh, our, our industry. So thanks for asking. I come from the semiconductor industry and uh, work a lot in Mexico right now. There's a huge investment in automotive, especially companies from Germany, France, US investing, not just for manufacturing, but to leverage the R&D and the engineering uh, talent that is there. But I've seen a trend lately also of, of um, manufacturing companies that are coming from China, Taiwan. You see Top Band, Quanta, Foxconn starting to build there to overcome this challenges they're facing with people that want to, or companies that want to take their business out of China. So they're coming here and built or in Mexico and building there. Do you see a similar trend in your industry or is it more in the automotive semiconductor space? I, I've seen some of it. Um, like I know there's like one of the biggest Chinese manufacturers of furniture set up shop in Mexico as well. Um, I know a ton of automotive is doing it, as you said, like Hyundai just uh, has been growing rapidly in like Monterey. Um, when it comes to, when it comes to what we'll call smaller sized consumer goods and things of that nature, I haven't seen a whole lot of Chinese firms setting up shop in, in Mexico. Um, I, and I, and I, I can't say I know exactly why, other than the fact that like, look, Mexico is, is still significantly more expensive than China, pretty much almost any way you cut it. Um, whenever we run quotes across multiple countries, we usually see it fall some way halfway between uh, the US and China. Um, so I would imagine for things that, that, that are, are, are large, cars, <laughs> for, furniture, cars, all these kinds of things, it might make more sense to do it uh, closer to home. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I would like to supplement uh, Rodney's response. Actually, uh, we talk about in terms of supply chain end-to-end -end solutions. So right now, is Mexico is actually trying to build a more like end-to-end -end supply chain solutions for the automotive industry. So right now, Tesla is going to suppose to announce the factories uh, break the ground in, uh, in Mexico in March, and also that uh, he's also encouraging Chinese suppliers to build the uh, components of manufacturing there as well. So that's on the automotive side, but there are other industries such as toys. Mattel is actually having the biggest factories in the world. It's located in Mexico because it's near shoring and also partly because of geopolitical issues. So I do see that Mexico has tremendous potential. And right now they're planning to build a railroad mm -hmm. uh, from, uh, from the narrowest parts of uh, Mexico, uh, which is close to the south near Oaxaca, uh, from Oaxaca to Veracruz. So because that one is only 18 miles to grow, do the railroad to actually bypass the Panama uh, Canal because that will be tried to siphon off some of the traffic. And also they have the ports in, uh, in the south as well. So that would actually help uh, the imports through Mexico, go to Veracruz, go to the Gulf of Mexico, and go to uh, Texas would be much faster. So they try to do that to bypass the Panama Canal. So I think that uh, the stars are lining up. So I think it depends on uh, the government uh, they're also providing subsidies uh, to encourage more investment in Mexico. But then, of course, uh, it depends on the details. So uh, I think that there's tremendous potential. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my question goes back to the beginning of the conversation with the introduction of the $800 tariff. I similarly remember where I was. Uh, my specific question is curious your speculation why it wasn't lifted during this recent time of inflation hurting the consumer's wallet, as well as your speculation, is it resilient enough that it has staying power over the next coming years? I, I think it hasn't been lifted because it's a bad look. I don't, I don't think any president wants to be the president that has seen a soft on China, right? So we already took the step, we're there, right? Um, does it have the staying power? 
should have been lifted to, to reduce inflation? It's hard to say. I mean, look, there's, there's, there's arguments on both sides, right? You can, you can remove the tariff, uh, and then all of a sudden, goods become cheaper, and people, there's already high demand, and people are just now spending more, and it could cause the opposite effect you want, which is just more inflation. Um, you could also look at it as like, hey, things are expensive. Let's remove the tariff. Things will become cheaper. You're the economist. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe well, you know. I can supplement a little bit on that. Uh, first of all, I think that there's some studies. Uh, I did a study as well. The tariff has so far has not been effective uh, in the following sense. Uh, because the tariffs is paid by the importers, not paid by China. It's the importers, which is most of US companies. Sure. So therefore, how do they recoup the cost? Is passed on some of the costs to the consumers. So that's why that they've been estimated it's around to cost increase by around two to three percent. So the American business actually wants uh, Biden to lift these tariffs. But bear in mind, as this is election year, this is also politics in terms of America need to be tough on China. So this is one way. Actually, now the Congress is actually proposing a, even more tariffs to block the Chinese imports. So even like the EVs. So now the biggest worry is about electric vehicles because the Chinese EVs is too cheap and too good. So they don't want it. So, but now China is going to set up maybe the factories in Mexico and then using the USMCA to re-import it back to the US. Now the question, now US need to figure out how to uh, maybe come up with a customized solutions, because if you change the USMCA, that will really rock the boat, right? So I think right now, Biden's administration is in a dilemma, to be or not to be. So that, I think, is a, we, this issue will not be resolved until the election is done. I think Biden administration did say that they're going to get rid of tariff before they got elected. So we had a program in uh, China. We we parked it there. We didn't leave. The, we didn't pull the program out, thinking that it will eventually go away. But it has been <laughs> it has been taking place yet yeah, for the last I don't know, seven eight years now. So I doubt it's gonna go away anytime soon. Follow up question for the economist then. <laughs> Any speculation why they haven't leveled the playing field in terms of Chinese corporations be able to drop ship under $800 direct to the American consumer, which American companies aren't able to do? Ah, okay. He is referring to a new rule. It's been around for a long, long time. It's not about China. It's called the minimis rule. So if you import anything shipped by eight, uh, less than $800, you do not need to pay the import tax. Now. This one create a lot of great opportunities for companies such as Timu and Xi'an. So that's how they can actually threaten a lot of retailers. Because now you order something is so cheap, they can ship directly from China. But you have to wait a bit longer, right? Now, then the question is that it's not just about China. If they change this rule, that will affect others' imports as well. So it's not just China. But then I think that as a whole, there's also the issue about enforcement. Who is going to check every single package coming to the United States? Because we just simply buy too many things. I can tell you the CBP, the, the Custom Border Protection Agencies, they have no manpower to do that. I can tell you they only inspect 3% of the containers. Even these are big containers. If you now talk about small packages, they don't have the manpower. Then you have to think about the cost and benefit trade-off. You're an MBA. You tell me. So in that case, are you going to enforce that? It costs a lot of manpower and all the time. So they don't have, cannot even handle the containers. How can they handle this volume? That is a practical problem, right? So that I, I think that's, that there is a big push to cancel the de minimis rule, but it's been around for decades. Now, if you want to change that, that means they have to go through the enforcement, which could be tricky as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, in view of time. So now we have to have final thoughts. What are your final thoughts? Uh, my final thoughts would be that, look, China, China's still, whether 
whether we like it or not, the manufacturing powerhouse of the world. I think over time that will change, but I think it's probably gonna take long, when it comes to the consumer goods at least, it's gonna take longer than I think most people expect. Okay, thank you. Kevin? All right, um, just to summarize what we talked about, um, you know, there's a lot of things that we discussed today, but one thing that you could actually invest in is people. The trust and for you to fly to all your supply chain and meet them in person and building that relationship is the most important part in keeping the supply chain um, well. And then um, just off a tangent on the side, um, I appreciate all the, uh, you know, the, the fact that we were invited to speak on, on, uh, our, on, on behalf of our 22 embassy here. Um, but I want to kind of figure out why would I be invited here? Whereas he, he's the, uh, the, the, the guru of all the supply chain. He probably has thousands of other uh, professors or a lot of uh, candidates out there. But mainly it's because I remember what he said during the class, and that is, unless you shine, we don't shine as a student. And because of that, I think he really wants to have both of us appear so we could shine as a representative of, of school so that the school could also shine. This is true embodiment of what UCL is all about, right? Families supporting family members to, to succeed and thrive in what they do. And this is exactly what Professor Tang and Lucy has done for us. So once again, I thank you for, for what you have done for us. So thank you. Well, thank, thank you. you. Well, my counterpoint is that without you, without you, without all of you, uh, the school would not exist. I would be, I would be out of work. So I want to thank you for that. You can come work with us. Yes, of course. Yes, thank you. All right. So let me just summarize uh, three thoughts. Uh, listening to uh, both of you sharing your insight, your practice, practical experience, and also wisdom. First, I, I discovered that is what you talk about, our discussion focusing on how to get uh, sourcing suppliers and then shipping logistics to, that is a material flow along the supply chain, right? But then we're also learning from you and then the early questions is there's also a people chain behind the supply chain. The people, because the people in the field making the materials, people in the factories, people in the office, so in that case, the supply chain is not just in terms of clicking the button. You need to actually kick the tire, meet the people, either in person or online, such that you really understand the supply chain. Otherwise, you are in your imaginary world. It's not going to happen. So that means that you need uh, trust, but verify, right. right? That's what I learned from Kevin. So the last one is also that I was very really deeply touched about your uh, story about social compliance. This is actually something I want to share with you that this is human nature. We tend to make judgments in seconds. There's a book, Gladwell, Blink. We'll form judgments in Blink. They say, oh, that is a good idea. Well, I think in the context of diversity, we need to be a bit more careful because that you are only familiar with what you're familiar with, even AI because the machine learning model is based on the past experience, based on the data, right? If you don't have enough data, it's human nature, it's, oh, he looks different uh, from a different background. So you may think about risk. You never thought, oh, maybe there's an opportunity for me to know this person I do not know with a different background. Learn, observe before you make judgments. We can do better. This is what the university is about. If you do just just blank, make snap judgments, you are no different than the majority. As an educator, I actually constantly remind myself, I always embrace to meeting someone who's different because you can always learn something from that person. So that's why I even wrote the blog. If someone speaks English with an accent, that means this person must speak two languages, minimum. <laughs> so that means he or she must have something that I do not know. Open up your heart, open your mind. You'll be a better person for yourself, for the company, for the world. Thank you.